The question is, do I need a microphone? OK, yes. Some people say yes, some people say no. I'll hold a microphone. It's kind of fun. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for that great introduction. My name is Jill Schiffelbein. My company's name is the Impromptu Guru. And as a lot of us know, in this digitally increased society today, your name and your brand become one and the same. So if at any point today you want to be technologically or digitally involved with this presentation, feel free to interact on Twitter. Use at Impromptu Guru, and that will link us all together. And so we can continue the conversations post-presentation. But what I want to do today is kind of trace back a little bit. So you learned about my lineage in communication, and you learned about some of my philosophies about public speaking and interaction with other people. What you may be thinking is, OK, that's all fantastic, but why is she here? Why is she at a teaching institute where we focus a lot on technology? So let me draw some parallels for you there. For the past 10 years, I've taken, taught, developed, and taught others how to develop and teach online courses. That is a mouthful, and I've practiced that many, many times. With that, I've gotten to work at ASU, and I got to start up the largest college, um, Liberal Arts and Sciences there. I got the pleasure of starting up the entire online program's infrastructure. And so I got the pleasure of working with 30 different academic units, tons of different faculty members, and discovering what makes education really tick for them in the different fields. And so today, I know that we have tons of different people here. So how many of you are social scientists, are in social science fields? Communication, political science, sociology. Um, I'm blanking on other ones. We have a couple of them. Humanities, some English, some history, that type of thing. Just a couple. Life sciences, natural sciences, business, engineering. What am I missing? Nursing, Nursing healthcare. Oh, that is big here. Big contingent there. All right, all right. Well, I know we're in good hands then if anything happens. That's great. So from all of these different academic disciplines, we all approach how we educate our students in a myriad of ways. And what I'm here to do today is to tell you that no matter what discipline you use, no matter what strategies you use to teach, no matter what subject matter you are disseminating information on to your students, that there is one thing that ties us all together. And that ties the, or the student experience together. I just messed that one up on my own. And it's communication. And communication, especially in online education, comes in the form of the human touch. And so that's what this topic is about. And a lot of people think when we're talking about technology, the human touch doesn't come into play a whole lot. But my argument is that if you want to teach successfully with technology, if you want to integrate digital strategies into your course, if you fail to look at and appreciate the human touch, the true communicative element of it, you're going to fall short of how successful those implementations can be. So if you look at this picture up here, when most of us think of human touch, we think of hands, we think of hugging, we think of touching. Maybe you know the image on the top of the Sistine Chapel, that's kind of what this reminds me of, right? That's what I was looking at. When I think of touch, I think of that. I think about human connection. But when you go and take a class, how many of you teach online? And keep your hands up if you also use technologies. Maybe you do hybrid courses. And if you've used technology in your classroom ever to help facilitate learning, keep those hands up. Right. We're all touched by this. But we often don't think of these hands as representative of human communication online. But I say we can re-strategize this and reframe it and start to look at the human touch in a slightly different way. That doesn't have to be human to human physical content or contact but rather metaphysical, if you will, content and contact that happens with people. So we have the power as individuals now with our society as evolved as it is, with the technologies moving at the pace that they do, we have the power to harness the human touch in so many different ways. And to me, that's what this picture represents. That world can be your subject area, that can be your field or discipline, that can be representative of knowledge that you're trying to disseminate and reach to people. But the beauty of technology is that now we have the power, each and every one of us, to give that world of information to students and let them carry that in their hand. And that's the power of technology. That's the power of the open society. And that really encompasses the power of the human touch, which is what we're going to talk about today. And in the introduction, we talked about how I kind of see that a lot of us let technologies do the driving. So this is my nice robotic hand, representative of that. What often happens in education and in corporate America, for that matter, is that we get a new tool. We get a new technology, and everyone's excited about it. When the first iPad came out, maybe this is a nerd thing. How many of you were thrilled with the first iPad? You're like, oh my gosh, an iPad, I got to get it. 
How many of you were thinking, it would be really cool if I could afford to get these for all of my students and use them in my classes? Anyone? A couple people? How many of you realize, oh, that's not the state of education today, so we're going to put that on the back burner? Yes. <laughs> that's the case for a lot of us. But so many people adapt technologies and pick up new technologies without first thinking through how they're going to be used. I challenge you, as you're going through this conference, as you're going through all of these workshops, you're going to hear about a lot of different um, and amazing and effective, provenly effective case studies, teaching methods, technologies, different implementations and integrations. They work differently depending on what I see as two factors. is one, what you're trying to accomplish, and two, your personal teaching style. So when you look at these new technologies, you look at these new techniques, you look at these activities that you can implement, whether they involve technology in the digital sense or not, think about this first. Are you thinking of adopting this new tool, technique, activity because of the technology, or are you first thinking about the learning objective you hope to achieve? And if you are not first thinking about the learning objective you hope to achieve, that technology is driving you, and you are not driving the technology. And that's the trick with technology because so many of us are looking for the latest, greatest, fastest thing so we can wow our students, so that we can teach them better, so that we can save us time. And what do we end up doing? Taking more time, right? How many of you have thought, oh, this is going to save me time, and in fact, it did not. It took more of your time. Only a couple of you. I am very impressed. I have made that mistake like 10 times, you know, many, many times. So I know what that's like. So my challenge to us today is to give you ways to get back into the driver's seat. So we are going to look at technology in a different way. You're going to reconceptualize how you use technology according to the human touch. And even better is you're not going to just hear it from me. So we're going to talk a lot today about how to reclaim that driver's seat and how to reconceptualize touching through technology and touching your students. And when I say touching, I do not mean physically touching, because if we do that, we get in trouble, right? Or at least we should. What I mean is touching people in a way that makes learning memorable, that makes learning something that is tangible, that makes learning stick. That's what we want to do as educators. Is anyone doing the whole teaching and educating thing just because uh, I can get up in front, collect a paycheck, and go home and not worry about what I did? Anyone? Anyone? There may be some of them, but they are not at this conference because that never really kind of defies the point of this conference. We do the education thing because we love it. We genuinely want to have an impact on society. We want to be agents of change, and we want our students to be empowered to be change agents in this society. But we need to be in control of the technologies that we are using to do that and not let the technologies control us and not lose sight of the learning objectives. So when I gave this presentation initially, and actually Todd's gotten to see part of this presentation before, I actually got asked to do a keynote in um, Scottsdale in February. And when they asked me what I was going to talk about, I said the human touch. And they thought I was crazy, because this was a tech tools conference. Uh, the human touch, this is kind of odd. And I explained it, and I said, just let me run with it. Just please let me run with it. You know, I've done workshops for you before. This will be OK. And they said, OK, we'll let you run with it. Kind of skeptical. When I got up to do the presentation three nights before, I thought, OK, I'm going to explain all of this wonderful communication theory and relate it to technology and how people teach in their classrooms and how it's important with the human touch. And then I realized that people would fall asleep about midway through it because I had the morning session and people didn't have enough caffeine. Yes, there's caffeine over there. So if you need it, please imbibe. But what I decided to do instead, and it was great, three days before this presentation, I decided to reach out to my students. And so I have my business, and I run that full time, but I stay in the classroom at least one class a semester. And this classroom, in this case, is the online classroom, because I love education, I love teaching, and I find that there is something very different from teaching in a corporate environment to teaching in an educational environment or in a higher ed institution. And I never want to lose sight of that. So I asked my students, I said, listen, I get to give a keynote address to about 100 odd faculty members at a local community college and I want your help. So for five points extra credit, <laughs> we heard the magic word, right? But the thing is, this was early in the semester. We were only like three weeks into the semester, so I didn't think people would do it, right? I had about 75 students. I said, for five points extra credit, which was less than 1% of their entire grade, I'm going to post this thing called VoiceThread, which I'll teach you about in just a second. And I want you to go and answer four questions 
and you're going to have the ability to influence how hundreds of faculty members across the state, across the country, and across the world see and view your role in online education as a student. And you'll get a chance to tell them what you think. Apparently those were the magic words, that an extra credit. So with that, literally 40% of my students within 48 hours logged onto a technology they had never used before, created an account, and posted four one minute or longer videos of themselves giving feedback. And so here's our students talking, but I'll show you what I used to do this. I used a tool called VoiceThread. How many of you have heard of it before? Yes. How many of you have used it? Awesome. What's your experience with it? Is that Com 259? Com 259? Com 259, no. No? Okay, that's what I teach, Com 259. I love it, business communication. But awesome, I use it in my business comm class all the time. Voice thread, so those of you who know about it, let me give you a, a little bit more education about it. But it has this little thing, conversations in the cloud, yada, yada. That's fine. Let me show you what it looks like. When you create a voice thread, you have the ability, and I can't reach all the way up there, but you can see it in the middle. You can put a video, an image, text, a PowerPoint slide, whatever you want in that middle screen. Cool, okay. So we're thinking, okay, we see some potential, but remember, don't let technology do the driving here. Start to think about what you can achieve with this as I'm talking about it. Then students have the ability, and all those little squares you see on the sides are different students, each one of them. And they have the ability to literally call in. You can see the phone icon there. They can call in an audio comment. So if bandwidth is an issue, they're out of town, out of country, what have you, fantastic. They can video record feedback. They can audio record or they can type. So there's four different ways for students to participate in this. This is a free tool, by the way, absolutely free. With this, students have agency through multiple channels to communicate with you. How many of you think this has some potential in what you do? Some of you, most of you, good. Again, cool technology. If it can't help you achieve, achieve a learning outcome or learning objective, it may not be for you. But I'm gonna show you how I used it, how I garnered feedback. I'll show you um, and talk to you about some examples about how I use this in the classroom and how truly technology such as this and similar technologies can really help enable the human touch. But the human touch is not just done through the use of these more, let's say, creative or interactive, engaging, involved technologies. It's also done through the messages that are communicated. And so we're going to do this kind of dichotomous approach, talking about the technology and talking about the messaging as we go through here. But what I love about this and what I did was I asked my students four questions. You'll get to see three of them here today. I literally had over an hour and a half of content to go through and search and cut down. So I will show you today three different edited videos straight from a variety of students on what they said about online education, what they said about the human touch, what they said about technology. And so when you're listening to these, and I'll show you the first one in just a second, I want you to think that these are my students. We have people ranging from 20 years old to 65 represented in these videos here. People who work full time, people who don't work at all, people who are online students full time, people who are blended students, some online, some in the classroom. A really diverse population here, which is great. But I want you to hear it from them, what they say about online education, and then I'm gonna tie some of it together for you. The first question I ask them is what makes a positive online course experience? How many of you think that you could answer this question right now for your students? A couple people? How many of you are kind of terrified to know what is going to be said by these students because it may put more work on you? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Let's go ahead and see what they have to say. An encouraging virtual instructor who over communicates and remains interactive with the students throughout the course. The last factor is balance. As you know, many of us online students have to balance our work lives and our school lives. And by balance, I do not mean the sport. I mean equal distribution of work. I look at coursework. It's equally distributed between papers, quizzes, discussion posts, and tests. Because you, if you end up doing the same thing so many times, you're going to get burned out. 
I have found that a clear communication of expectations and constructive feedback from my instructors are essential for a positive online experience. The participation of other students in online discussions also contributes to a positive experience, specifically in that it adds an additional layer to the educational experience as the students work together and learn from each other. I think class participation is really important. Other students participating, interacting, engaging other students really helps it to become almost second nature, like common knowledge, something that you're used to and familiar with talking about. So it really makes it comfortable, the information very comfortable. Um, learning tools. Learning tools are very, very helpful. Things like flashcards or practice tests, things that really are going to help expand and, and test the knowledge that you're not just reading, but you're also getting interactively. Um, and interaction with my professor. Simple, clear, organized, and straightforward. Instructions of the assignments and what the expectation of the classes. I also think having good and constant communication with feedback and interactions is very important to making it a, a good experience for, for the class. Developing communication with other students who are in your class that may be of help when you need a quick answer. And last but not least, a supportive professor who you can contact whenever you need to. What makes a positive online course experience? Well, for me, it starts off with a detailed course syllabus. Uh, one that allows me to schedule out my entire semester from day one. Also, communication with fellow students is important. Uh, sometimes taking an online course, you can feel like you're taking it by yourself. So knowing that others may have the same question or share the same concerns is, is definitely um, nice and makes it a positive online course experience having clear expectations from the professor on what they expect from us during the semester. Also, having a professor who's engaged in the course, not only as far as discussion threads about the assignments, but also things that tie into current events and popular culture that relate to what we're learning. For me, the first and one of the most important things is good teacher communication. Um, I believe that it's really important to have good teacher um, interaction, whether it be the comments that they post based on the comments that you post, or just sending you an email to see how you're doing. Just to be able to have that interaction is key to, I think, a good, successful online course. Pretty thorough communication from the instructor at the beginning of each um, academic week, telling us, you know, this is what you need to do, thanks for doing this, um, I expect you to do this this week. The use of current technology, like the Adobe Connect that our instructor uses, it's really great. Receiving feedback, whether it, you know, the encouragement or you know, constructive criticism, um, has been really beneficial on as far as learning, you know, learning the concepts of, uh, of the course. I want to make sure that I have the ability to interact with both the students and my instructor. Uh, and on top of that, I'd like to, you know, have an instructor there that's and also willing to, to converse with its student body you know, in order to ensure that you know, that open line of communication is available. You know, the way that I've seen it is the more communication I do with students together uh, to the instructor or combination uh, has furthered my learning uh, abilities and it's made it a lot, not only a lot easier to understand, but you know, a lot more fun, uh, which ultimately kind of makes the overall learning experience uh, a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, you have to have a professor that's helpful, uh, a professor that's organized, someone that has clear communication methods, that is uh, an over-communicator, if anything. What were some of the trends you picked up on? Shout them out. Well, communication, yeah. I, I couldn't have asked for better myself. That was the obvious one. But what about communication was important to these students? Interaction, over-communication? Presence of the instructor? Positive support commentary? Clear and concise. Expectations. Huge, huge, huge right there. What was funny to me is when I was thinking, what would I like students to say? If I could pay some students to say some things, what would I like them to say You know, that could support this speech? I couldn't have paid better students. <laughs> I didn't pay them, I gave them extra credit, kind of the same thing. But I did not tell them at all what I wanted from them. I actually said, I want you to tell me exactly what you think, to know without any uncertainty that you will not be penalized 
if you say negative things. You will not be penalized in any way. How many people think after the third week of class that they can say that to their students and get uncensored feedback? Some people. Why do you feel that? Why do you feel that you could? Open the communication barrier. And you've also established trust. You've established a keen sense of trust with your students. And that's because you've made your presence known. It's incredibly difficult as an educator in any format, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or online, to gain the trust of your students. Not just respect, oh, I'm going to listen to you because you're my teacher, but the genuine trust and admiration of your students. How many of you strive to do that constantly? I mean, how many of us have done it every single time perfectly? Anyone? Because if so, I want your secrets. Yes? I, I do every time. Every time. <laughs> Amazing. I want to be loved like you. Absolutely. <laughs> but what's so difficult about that is because we have anywhere from, let's say, 10 to 1,000 different personalities coming into our courses, right? Depending on how large your courses are. And to be able to gain the trust, admiration, and legitimate respect of that many different voices is a true challenge. What I'm going to do right now to give you a preview of how we're going to move forward is this. I'm going to make some more comments on this. I'm going to show you another video. And then for those of you who like to take notes, how many of you are there out there? Yes, love to take notes. They're so fun. I'm going to give you a list on how you can accomplish more successfully this trust, this respect, this open line of communication and establishing these parameters for your students. But there's some students I want you to hear before I do that. But what I also want to comment on on this is that students really want expectations. And while these were online course students, the lessons that they are trying to convey, the words they are trying to convey, apply in any course. How many of you, when you were going through school, had the most ambiguous <coughs> syllabus from an instructor? How many of you were frustrated as heck because of that? <laughs> yes, it's really, really frustrating. And so let's say you have a face-to-face -face student. That's frustrating. You have a hybrid student who only gets you half the time. That becomes more frustrating. You have an online student who never physically meets you. Imagine the frustration level. And so expectations become more and more important the further and further away from students you move. However, the idea of the human touch and what I'm trying to convey here and what I'll give you tips for after the next video is to move that human touch closer to them so they feel that they can communicate with you anytime, that they feel that you are right there with them, that they feel that they know you, that they feel that you are someone that they can email at 2 o'clock in the morning because they're scared and it's okay. Now, they don't expect you to reply at 2 o'clock in the morning, and some do. That's a problem. We'll talk about that. <laughs> but if you established expectations clearly at the beginning, in a couple of different ways I'll show you about shortly, you can make that a reality, where you have that open communication, where your students love you and give you all this feedback, and that they communicate with you in a way that not only makes you a better instructor, but helps them learn better too. The other thing I want to point out about the commonalities in this video here is the student-to-student -student communication. Student-to-student. -student. What I always tell instructors that I work with, and really what I tell anyone that I work with in terms of training, is that you have three types of interactivity that have to take place. For those of you who like numbered lists, this is a great one. The first one, you have student to content. So whoever your learner is, they're going to be interacting with your content in some way. The next thing is student to instructor. The student has to interact with your instructor in some way. And the third one is student to student. And so many of us leave that out. Actually, so many of us leave the student to instructor out too, and that's sad. But we take the student to content for granted. When we're building out a course, when we make a syllabus, when we're putting down the learning objectives, we're thinking this is how the student's going to interact with the content. Rarely, when we're in the hustle and bustle of making those syllabi because we gotta get them out every semester and we gotta pump those puppies out, do we think of how is the student gonna interact with me? Maybe we have a one paragraph communication policy in our email that says, if you email me, I will respond within 24 hours, Monday through Friday, yada, 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 whatever your verbiage is. But that's as far as that goes. And then in the syllabus, do we have policies that say, here's how you will interact with other students? 
Maybe some people have a, ca a cause on uh, respect, like how you're going to respect other students. I see a nod back here. What's your policy with student no to student? Attacks on yeah, no attacks. Absolutely. Discussion boards being respectful. But we talk more about rules and policies instead of encouragement and opening it up. And that's how we can kind of shift that paradigm, right? In our syllabus, we always talk about these policies. This is what you have to do. This is what you shouldn't do. How about here's what you can do? Here's what is fun to do. Those are different things we can put in our syllabi to start incorporating more elements of the human touch, to start getting students to interact more and more with each other. Because whether students are in a face-to-face -face class, in a hybrid class, or an online class, student-to-student -student communication fosters learning. It fosters thought, and it opens up discussion. And a lot of us, when we teach online classes, especially for the first time, we think, oh, we'll have these discussion boards, and students will post, and they'll just want to communicate with each other. How many of you have made that mistake? <laughs> Absolutely. Like the first discussion board I ever did, this was about eight years ago. I put up a discussion board, said, okay, you need to do three posts per week and discuss this topic and make sure your discussions generate more questions. You know what happened? 10 minutes before the deadline, everyone posted three, let's be frank, BS posts that had really not much to do with the content, nothing to do in relation to other people's content. And maybe a couple students actually saw the value in responding to other people, but that wasn't the real thing. So we learn how to craft more creative discussion assignments that actually elicit student feedback. We learn to make requirements that require, that was redundant, I know, responses to other students. But still, it's again the policies of not don't do this, but here's what you can do to reframe it. Let's look at this next question, and then I'm going to give you that list I promised. How do you want instructors to communicate with you? And this was really enlightening to me because I always thought of myself as a pretty adept communicator. I'm like, OK, this is good. Some of these students gave me some ideas, and some of them I think you'll laugh at, too. Ideally, my preference is that instructors should embody a communication style that is casual yet professional. I also find it important for instructors to be supportive, encouraging, open, and offer help with constructive feedback. In terms of medium, watching a video recording of my teacher allows me to put a face to the person behind my the computer monitor and offers insight to the teacher's personality and their style of teaching. I feel like the most effective way that a young professor can communicate with you is through as many channels of communication as possible. Email, Skyping, interactions, recordings, anything that can get you familiar with forms of communication that you're going to have to use in the everyday real world. Um, I find that email is way more effective than any other means for me. I can send an email at my disposal and just wait for a response when it's convenient for my professor or somebody else. I also would like feedback on the quality of the work that I'm, I'm turning in. And I'm not getting all of the credit. Why am I not? I would also like timely communications that affect my workload because as an online student, I budget time for my homework and study. The use of voice thread, I think, is huge in communication because it actually adds a personal touch and doesn't leave the students, uh, um, feeling, online students at least, uh, feeling like they're fending for themselves. Um, I think it adds a great personal touch. I think video is key. I've always been a learner that learns better uh, by watching. Uh, rather than reading, it's just not my strong suit. So uh, I think I'd like to see a lot more video from my instructors. Also, I would definitely like them to post uh, as much information as possible on the course page because that's something that you visit often. So it's just nice to know that the professor is actually participating in the class. It's important that not only you, the instructor, but the student put effort into making it a good course. So I'd say that um, email is probably um, the best way of communication with the student. The way I'd like my instructors to communicate with me would be through the online forums on the course homepage. It's a quick and easy way to get any uh, new information or uh, old information, uh, anything that I might have missed. You know, in addition to that, these video conferencing uh, abilities that we have, I might not be able to sit down face to face with my instructor, but by having this uh, ability to communicate uh, through video and audio, uh, it's just as good as being able to sit down and you know, in all reality, it saves me a couple bucks in gas. Oftentimes with the deadlines of online courses, they move so rapidly that you can't afford to miss deadlines. You can't afford to miss 
uh, communication point with your professor. So, um, if method is communication, uh, method of communication is email, then um, you certainly have to be responsive. Um, you know, text message is, is awesome, but you can't you can't have 100 or 200 or 400 kids or students texting you. I like it when our professors send us out a weekly email to all the students and uh, just give us a heads up on what's going to be expected for that week. Also, I have found that um, communication through our weekly discussion boards have proven to be just as useful. I think it would also be fun if we were to have a designated time where we could have uh, like an online chat for tech, uh, instant messaging. Well, first of all, I'd like to have a good relationship. It is tough online since you don't usually have that face-to-face -face contact with your professor. However, it's always nice to feel comfortable with them so you know that you, when you can go to them or need to go to them, that they are there for you at all times. Let's talk about some threads here. What did you hear? Shout it out. Personal. Personal. Bueller, Bueller. Consistent. Consistent, timing, communication, email, surprisingly to me. That was one thing that I was kind of shocked at was email, 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 email. I love the comment on uh, text messaging, but at least he recognized that, yeah, you can't have about 100 students texting you. Yeah. A variety. Not all students like the same method. Yes. Absolutely. What I loved, one of the students, and actually a couple students said this, but I tried to edit it down so you got different representative viewpoints. There were a handful of students who actually said that the students need to take responsibility for it too. And when I heard that, I almost fell out of my chair. I'm thinking, yes, I've done something right. This is fantastic. The other thing that I find really interesting about this, and this one I edited out, but I'll tell you this anyway. I had one student who said, it would be really nice at the beginning of each semester if each teacher I had called me and introduce themselves personally. And <laughs> I kind of laughed and I actually responded directly to every single student who did this because I got through email their permission to use it, show it, that type of thing. But I responded specifically to the student and said, I would absolutely love to call all of my students. If I wanted to have a 10 minute conversation with each of my students at the beginning of the semester, this is how long it would take me and I would have to not do anything else. I said, well, I see where you're coming from. Please know that you can call me anytime. That's why I put my phone number in the syllabus. And again, make this that two-way street. You know, and she followed up. She's like, I actually never thought about how many students you probably teach at a time. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I found that amusing. But it was nice to hear what students wanted, what students thought they needed. But here's what I'm going to give you. Yeah. I just wanted to add that one semester when I was not teaching one to two hundred uh, students, I, I just had one section, I did actually call all of them and some of them were super appreciative and some of them were sort of like, uh, what are you calling for? <laughs> what did I do wrong? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean it's mixed and that's what was interesting about this and so we pointed it out is a variety of channels that students wanted. So what I'm going to do is from these videos, from my experiences, and from the perspective that we need to communicate the human touch as much as possible, I'm going to give you some communication musts. And I call these communication musts for online classes, but quite frankly, they are for any class. And for anyone who has a face-to-face -face class who uses a Blackboard, um, Canvas, or whatever um, learning management system site to help supplement the material, these are things that you can do to make it easier on your students to understand how the class is going to progress, to understand you as an instructor, and also to get yourself better on track to get this, you know, magic, open, wonderful line of communication and feedback. So the first thing that no matter in what channel or form you're teaching, I suggest that you make two videos. And you think, wait, if I'm teaching in person, why on earth do I need to make videos? Because not everyone comes to that first class period. People add your class later. People sometimes also need to be reminded of things. So two videos before the semester starts that you should make available with your syllabus. The first one is a professor or instructor introduction video. This is a video, a couple minutes long. Hey, this is who I am. Here's something about me. Let's make me human. And for those of you who are teaching online classes, this is incredibly important because it puts that face behind everything they hear on the computer. You may not have time to make videos for everything, but when you make voice announcements, as long as you've had those videos up from the beginning, they will be able to see you in 
their minds while you're speaking and while they're listening to you. If you get really good at it, they will actually be able to see and hear you when they're reading your assignment sheets. Now that's a winning combination right there. That's when you've achieved that touch. So the first thing you need to make this introduction video, one to three minutes, no more than that, make sure you put something in there that makes you human. Not just your accolades, not where you graduated from, not from you, why you teach. How about why you teach? Why do you love what you do? Why are you interested in this field? And then I always like to put something fun about me that's pretty random that most students wouldn't know. And I get so many comments back on that. So one thing you may not know by looking at me is I used to do triathlons and I did Ironman. And that was a really big part of my life and I do cycling racing now. Students don't know that about me. Students aren't on my Facebook. They don't see those pictures. Students don't go out and do the extensive Google search that you'd have to do to find out that information about me. However, I've gotten more comments from students about that. Oh my gosh, my mom did this, my dad did this, my friend, my sister, my cousin, I'm thinking about doing it. I'm gonna run a 5K this semester. And you get so much of that human touch. So much of that back just by putting out a little bit about yourself. I've also gotten similar comments from travel. Like, what's the favorite place you've traveled to? And I have students comment back with that. The second thing you need to do, so you have your intro, instructor introduction video, the second thing you need to do, and depending on if you're teaching online or in person, this may be even more important, is the course expectations video. Course expectations video. This is where from day one, actually before day one, you establish the expectations, not only for the students, but for you as an instructor in the course. So this video isn't all about you telling them what to expect. It's also telling them what you plan to do for them as well. So again, it's that two-way street. It's that touching, that back and forth. Touch doesn't happen with only one person. You need two people to make that happen. Same with this course expectations video. So you want in this video to communicate clearly what your expectations of them are and what they should expect from you. And so in those expectations of students, deadlines, you can repeat some of the things that are in your syllabus. That's okay because let's be honest, who reads a syllabus word for word and remembers everything in there? Not many people, if any. So put that in there. Put things that are pertinent. Put what you expect them to do. Like I expect realistically that you're going to spend three to six hours per week, depending on how fast you read, how fast you study, how fast you process. Give them those timelines. I expect that if you have a problem, you will contact me. I expect that if you need an extension, you will contact me. Let them know that those things are okay. And let them know that you are happy to work with them if they have questions. That you're happy to discuss things with them further. If you find something interesting in this course and you want to talk about it more and students in the discussion aren't giving you the depth you want, email me. Let's have those conversations. How many, we love having those conversations, right? Raise your hand. If you actually get a student who's like, I'd like to talk about Theory X more, you're like, holy cow, yes, let's go to lunch, you know? We're so excited to have those engaged students. But you can communicate that in the course expectations video. The other thing that you can do is set expectations for yourself. Say yes, I am online probably more than I should be and sometimes you will send me an email and get a response instantaneously. You should not expect this. Here is what you should expect with email. Here's what you should expect with a phone call. And I always say if you do send me an email and I don't respond within 24 hours, please resend it because it can get lost in a queue, it can go to spam. It can just be one of those days where I had so much going on that I need a little extra bump. We've all been there, right? We all need that every once in a while, I'll fully admit it. But in the course expectations video, you're laying all this out. If you're teaching especially a condensed course, so maybe you have a semester long course that you're cramming into seven weeks or five weeks in a summer, this video is even more important because you need to lay that out right at the beginning. A single day in a summer course is equal to three full days in a regular semester. And if you're not prepared to put that much time into the course, this is not what you should be doing. Again, laying out those expectations. So it may seem like, okay, yeah, this makes sense to do, do it. See the difference it makes. Whether you're teaching in person, whether you're teaching online or hybrid, just do it and see the difference it makes. Next thing you need to do, number two, have a centralized, organized area for information. So you can communicate via as many channels as you want, and we know that students like this but always have a centralized area that no matter what, everything goes there. And then you can communicate from multiple channels from there out. For most of us, if we use Blackboard or a similar technology, that's a course homepage. 
So you make sure that in the course homepage, in the announcements, et cetera, everything is there. If you create supplementary materials, maybe you post an announcement and you also make a video, you link to that video from the homepage. Everything is organized in that homepage, and then you can make multiple channel communication spawn out from there and stream out from there, but put it all in one place. Third thing, in that course homepage or in a module area, depending on how you organize your course, every single week or every single module or every single unit, however you organize your course, however you want to call it, have a housekeeping. We do this in our face-to-face -face classes probably without even realizing it. So let's say you have a Monday, Wednesday class. Every Monday you're probably like, okay, how was everyone's weekend? Or this is what we're going to be doing for this week. You set up that week. If you're doing a hybrid or an online course, students need the same thing. But we often don't think about it. Here's what I typically do in my classes to save myself time and make it easier on me. What I do is I make two of these announcements. Wait, that's more work. But it's not. Hold on. The first of the announcements is the general layout of the week. The general housekeeping that no matter when I teach this, they're going to have these three assignments due this week. That stays the same every semester. That can transfer every semester. The second one that I add is a voice announcement or a voice post that basically says, here's what I noticed from last week. Here's how that can apply moving forward. Here's something that was current in the media you can check out. Something that lets them know that you're not just a recording, that you're actually live in there and paying attention. I cite people's names in the discussion board. Oh, look at Bob. Bob did a great post last week. If you guys hadn't had a chance to read it, really make sure to do that because he illuminates some great insights, et cetera, et cetera. Call students out. Give them accolades. Commend them. Do that in this format. And if you do it in a way that is audio-based instead of just text, your results will be better. But again, what do you need to do with this? Link it from the Home page, right? The course home. Absolutely. Make sure all of that is organized. And that seems so intuitive, but so many of us don't do it or we forget to do it when we post things. And that's something that's absolutely key. The other thing, number four, if you're making this list, check-ins. And this is the best opportunity to collect feedback from your students. I do this in my full semester classes. I do it quarterly. I do it three times during a seven week class. And that may seem a little intense, but it doesn't take that much time. And what I do is I calculate at that quarter how many points are available in the class so far. I make a grading scale. And I send out to every student. Now, if I have a small class and can send out just to students who have A's, students who have B's, like, congratulations, you're doing an awesome job, a little extra encouragement, I do so. When I have really huge classes and a lot of them, that's you know, it takes a lot of time. But if you, at the very least, send an email out every quarter to all of your students saying, we've completed 250 points in the course so far. There are 750 left to go. Here is the current grading scale. If you have X number of points, you are earning an A. X number of points, a B, et cetera. Then, with that email, and what I like to do, to make sure people are reading and make sure people are responding, ask a question. What is the most exciting thing you've learned in this class so far? Something that's non-threatening initially. What's something that could have helped you more in this class so far? Again, some non-threatening feedback type questions. What this does is it gets people talking to you. It starts opening up those lines of communication. And even if you teach in person, students just like you are rushing into class and out of class for jobs, for other engagements, for meetings, and don't always have time to come to your office hours to come and get all those things. These emails create that human touch. Those emails really bring students in. And then you get feedback from your students that you didn't expect. And you open up those lines of communication and create that relationship, which is incredibly important. If you do those four things in your classes, I can guarantee you that the amount of touch that your students feel will increase. I can guarantee you that the communication between you and your students will increase. And I can almost guarantee you, I can't make promises I can't keep, that you'll learn something from your students in the process. At least I know I always have. So those are four very instrumental things you can do with your classes, no matter in person, online, etc. The next video I'm going to show you, and I'm only going to show you part of it, is what do you want online teachers to know about students? And yes, these were all online students. However, these are our students. These are the everyday students who are in our classes. So whether you teach online or not, these can apply to you. I would say first and foremost, it takes a lot of responsibility to be an online student. You really have to focus 
stay on track of things, otherwise you'll get far behind. And just knowing that most of us are working individuals, to make sure that teachers are very precise, give good feedback, over-communicate, and make things easy to follow. Obviously, we're doing this because we want to continue our education, or some are just starting their education, what have you. But we want to make sure that we're doing things correctly, getting the right feedback, and bettering ourselves as we move forward. What I would like the online instructors to know about our students is that it is very important for us students to connect with the instructor. I think it's important for online instructors to have a basic knowledge of some of the common characteristics that are typical or even unique for online students. Students in this type of environment benefit from constructive feedback and support that may motivate them to perform, to perform their best and be successful. Is that a lot of us probably work full time as we are taking this opportunity to further our education online. At the same time, we are committed in being probably older adults taking class uh, online. We are committed and take this uh, online education very seriously. I want to feel like I'm a regular student, uh, not just online. I want to feel like I'm part of the campus. Also, I take pride in my work and want to do well, so I'd like to know if there are areas that I can improve on. And I like content that applies to the real world. I'm going to pause it there and just summarize some of the comments here for sake of time because I want to do an activity with all of you. But what I like about these comments, and you'll hear more, is that we need to be a little flexible. We need to be cognizant. And what I loved about what the last student just said is I want to feel like a real student or a normal student. And what I found um, in my experience, too, in working um, with community colleges is some students there don't feel that they're a normal student because they're not at a four-year university. And I think that's so sad because I, I'm actually proud of what they're doing at the community college level and I'm sure many of you are too. And so that type of communication, that type of touch and that type of messaging really gets at making the student feel quote unquote normal, whatever that means for the student. And understanding common characteristics of our students. I know here they do a really good job preparing faculty to be instructors in this environment. I've talked to Todd a lot about the different things that they do and I think it's so cool because at a lot of institutions, a lot of larger institutions, you don't get any training. You get thrown into the rat's den and if you've had teaching experience before, you're lucky because you just kind of get eaten up and thrown in there and it's a trial by fire. But here you get that experience. You get those trainings if you want them. And we want to feel too like normal teachers, right? We don't want to be these crazy outsiders. Well, maybe we do in some cases because it's kind of fun. But we want to feel normalized. We want to feel that we're a part of something. We want to feel a part of the whole, just like our students do. We have demands, they have demands. What else was communicated in this video is how they feel a responsibility for their education, but a lot of teachers don't treat them that way. They treat them like they're little kids. Now, we have students that we need to treat like they're little kids, and we all know this. But there's a lot of students who don't. And by treating everyone the same way, we almost diminish the ability of those other students to thrive and be responsible for themselves. And that's why I find that course expectations video is so important. Because in that, you can communicate. You have to take responsibility for your learning. You have to be proactive with the communication. You need to do this. And in exchange, here's what I will do for you. It's that give and take. It's that back and forth. The other thing that I find in all types of education that we as instructors sometimes fail to see, and I am fully guilty of this, that's why I will say it as a blanket, and this is just a generalization, is actually one of my favorite axioms too, and it's Walter Wick, Bevan, and Jackson from the 1960s, so communication scholars, Ian, I know you'll know this, the most famous axiom of all of communication is one cannot not communicate. How many of you have heard that before? A couple people. One cannot not communicate. Yes, it is constructed in a very horrible grammatic way, I know that. One cannot not communicate. What does that mean for us as instructors? That means when you don't communicate expectations, that sends a message. When you don't communicate about yourself, that sends a message. When you're not posting regular updates in an online class, that sends a message. Your lack of communication is communication. And unfortunately, that tells your students something that you probably don't want them to be told. 
It's giving a message that you're not as engaged. It's giving a message that you're not following around with what they're doing. That's why I say every week I have those two housekeeping announcements. I have the one that's kind of like the blah, 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 here's what you're going to do, yada, yada, yada. But then I have the one that shows them that I am communicating with them, I am listening, I am paying attention to what you're doing in those discussion boards. Yes, there is not a robot grading your assignments. We know there's not a robot because if there were, we would all be so happy. So happy. <laughs> Absolutely. When we have the robot discussion graders, we will all be in a better place, right? But no, I am taking the time. You are all taking the time. When you hand your students papers back in class, if you teach face to face, have you ever thought of creating an audio recording, a podcast, or a short video that says, here are some things that you could have done better. Here are some things that you did well. And how about this? Next time you have that assignment in a class, you have this archive of audio and video recordings that you can give to your future students to help guide them along. So you accomplish two things. You help your current students realize that you've paid a lot of attention to them, and you help future students better gauge your expectations on an assignment, all in one foul swoop. How many of you have done something like that before? Awesome. A couple of people. How do they like it? They like it. Um, they like hearing a voice. They like hearing a human being. It also gets some of those housekeeping and lecture items out of the way in a hybrid course, and you can focus on in-class discussion, interaction, those things when you have a face-to-face -face time to get it. Exactly. Take care of all that stuff that can be done online online. Do those more interactive activities where touch, physical or otherwise, is important in person. Someone else said back here they've done it. Was that you? I'm picking on you. Yeah. That's all right. Sometimes I'll just post to other students' papers and take their, you know, take their names off. Here's a really good model, and here's here are the things that are really good about this. Yeah, absolutely. For the next time, try this next time. Absolutely. And if you supplement that with an audio recording that says, look at this paper, and when you're looking at it, here's what I want you to look at. Not just text, but make that audio, make it interactive so that people can go through. Again, you accomplish so much. And again, that meets the multiple channels, right? People learn in different ways, text, audio, video. However they learn best is how we need to communicate. But the biggest thing is we need to communicate the messages we want communicated and remember and remain cognizant that not communicating is still communicating. And that's huge. And if I can impart you with anything, it's that, because when we choose technologies, I'll tie this back, they choose technologies that we think are awesome, we think they're great, and we don't keep those learning objectives in mind, what happens is we have students using these technologies, getting random grades, and not getting a whole lot of feedback, and not getting a whole lot of learning because they're just using them to use the technology for the sake of that cool tool. We need to tie those all back together. So I want to do a little activity to kind of demonstrate this whole one cannot not communicate, blah, 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 I slipped that up. One cannot not communicate thing. But for that, we're going to do some calisthenics. So we all need to get up and get about yay. Yay, Wido, this is fun. This is fun. And I'm not going to change the slide yet. This is fun. Get a little room, get a little stretching. I'll do this activity, I'll say some wrap-up comments, and then you'll be on with your day, and my hour will be perfectly filled. So. This is when I risk my life to entertain. <laughs> All right, so this is called do what I say and not what I do. It will mimic a childhood game to some extent, but there's some rules with this. First rule is you have to be watching me at all times. No zoning out. My ego needs your attention right now. I'm risking my life for you all. Pay attention up here, right? I'm sarcastic. Hopefully that comes through by now. So do what I say and not what I do. And it's going to become increasingly harder. So everyone, shake out your hands a little bit. Touch your head. Touch your shoulders. Touch your head. Touch your knees. <laughs> Difficult, right? OK, that was a piece of cake. Shake it back out again. Let's shake it back out again. All right, do what I say and not what I do. Touch your shoulders. Touch your head. Touch your knees. Touch your waist. Touch your knees. Touch your shoulders. Touch your waist. <laughs> a little difficult, all right. Shake it back out again. <laughs> touch your head. Touch your shoulders. Touch your head. Touch your shoulders. Touch your waist. Touch your head. <laughs> this is my most entertaining part of the day. <laughs> all right, last time. Who's ready to go warp speed? Can we keep up with this? We have some energy in us? Yes! Oh, my three commenters! You're awesome! Okay. <laughs> Touch your shoulders, touch your head, touch your shoulders, touch your head, touch your shoulders, touch your knees, touch your waist, touch your knees, touch your waist, touch your head. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs>
I really like that activity because it makes me laugh. That's really why I do it. It doesn't have a point. It actually does have a point, and we'll talk about it. But it kind of mimics Simon Says, right? And we always had fun playing that game when we were younger because it was a challenge, and you got to laugh. And whenever everyone would mess up, everyone would laugh and be like, ha, 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 funny, kind of like this. Love it. The point of this is, this is the same thing as one cannot not communicate, but also that actions speak louder than words. Old adage, but it is so true. What I love about this activity is watching people, yes, that amuses me, but in all seriousness, watching people's minds process what they need to be doing. This is a simple activity. We are alive and in person. I'm asking you to only focus on one thing, not contemplate theories, not contemplate grammar, not contemplate anything at a high knowledge base level. I'm asking you to focus on a relatively simple task. Yet, when my actions and words did not match up, people struggle. And even if you got it right, the split second mental process you had to do to go to the right thing is indicative of the physiological happenings in our body when confusion is present. Imagine when that confusion comes in the form of a poorly worded assignment or an assignment that, as instructors, we think is worded wonderfully, because that's often the case, at least for me, I'm perfect. Yeah, not really. But then students have questions, and we have to follow up. When actions and words are not synonymous, <coughs> you have this confusion. And whether you're teaching in person, whether you're teaching online, whether you're using a technology for the right or wrong reasons, this confusion can happen. Actions and words need to be synonymous in order for you to be effective. So we want to make it look like this. Your actions and your words must be synonymous to communicate effectively, to get your message across, and to get that human touch involved. And when we pull this back in to the idea of using technologies in the classroom, if you are using technologies that don't support your learning objectives, it's the same thing as your actions and your words not being synonymous. Your words being the assignment, the action being the technology, and they don't match up. That's why we have to take control over what we want technologies to do. That's why being in the driver's seat is not the job of the zeros and ones. Hopefully you got that joke. Yes. Oh, a couple people like, oh yeah, that's funny. Other people, God, she's a nerd. Yeah, that's okay too. But that's the whole point here, is that our actions and our words and everything we do, effective leaders, effective managers, effective teachers, have actions and words being synonymous. Whether it's manifest through technology, manifest through an assignment, manifest through a lecture, no matter how that messaging is getting across, if it doesn't match up with the end goal, your effectiveness is going to diminish. And that's what happens so much when we're trying to chase this elusive, oh, must be the best teacher I can possibly be and integrate all of these technologies. And this is not a speech to say don't use technology. I love technology. But you know what? If VoiceThread is one of the newer technologies out there that we can use to communicate to our students, but darn it, just using a simple voice board is gonna work better for your purpose, use that voice board. Make sure it meets the objective at the end because then those actions and words will be synonymous. You'll be able to follow through with your students and you'll get that human touch across because what happens in any relationship, I'll make a parallel. You and your significant other, good friend or whatever, have a little argument. That's never happened to anyone in here, right? Never, never. You guys have a little argument. So what happens? There's a little disconnect, right? A little disconnect. You have to work at bridging that back together. That disconnect is often because actions and words weren't synonymous. That's what most of our arguments, if you drill it down, are really about. And we work to bridge that gap better. But we have relationships with our good friends, our significant others. We have that human touch already established. So mending those, if it's something minor, is a lot more simple than it is, let's say, a student who you fail to give decent feedback to, who you fail to say, here is how you can make your paper better, but instead, paper after paper, mark them down for the exact same things. People in here don't do this. You guys really care about teaching. That's why you're here. But you know some of your peers who probably do. And that's sad. But we want to strive to be above that. We want to make the actions and words synonymous. We want to make it so that when a student does something that can be improved, we communicate to them. We create that touch. Because through communication, relationships are formed. And without forming those relationships, we know, and it's documented in research, it's documented with scientific studies, empirical studies, that was redundant, qualitative studies, all types of studies show 
that personality, human touch, and relationships foster learning. And so we need to think about the tools that we use. We need to think about our actions and our words being synonymous. And we need to think about what messaging we give across when we communicate. And always, always, always remain conscious of the fact that not sending a message sends an even clearer message than you thought. Thank you very much for your time. I have about five minutes. I'll happily take questions.